Recorded live at Tox and Tasting Studios, it's the Clerical Errors Podcast. The podcast that shows you what's behind the collar. Let's go. From the Tox and Tasting Studios, this is the Clerical Errors Podcast. The podcast that shows you what's behind the collar. This is Bull Hagen. This is Berg. This is Vicker. And Peter's here, hey Pete. Hey Pete. Let's go, we got the whole band. <laughs> You're looking good, Berg. I know. <laughs> nice vaulted ceilings. Where, yeah. where exactly are you? Are you in an undisclosed location? Or? Yes, I'm in my bunker in uh, Lander, Wyoming. So, Lander, Wyoming. Hmm. All right. How's it going? You've been there. You were installed what a week or so ago? Yeah, yeah. Um, ten days. Um, so June 25th, uh, and had my first Sunday, and yeah, just living the dream. Living the dream. Did uh did uh fifteen point I guess we give him a number, Baldwin. Was he uh was he at your installation? No, he was kind of a loser. He didn't show up. Uh, but his wife came with their oh. with their three kids, so that was nice. Oh, was he was he somewhere else or Yeah, I think he had some LWML thing that he had to do, so mm-hmm. No. So I okay. will be giving him the guilt trip that, you know, he need, we need some more Western updates since, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, well the, the next time uh, you give a meeting, just bring a microphone. There we go. Well, as one well, thing, Berg, that the, the viewers have been dying to know, the listeners, excuse me, is uh, do you have a hat yet? Not yet. <sighs> got a baseball cap. You got you to gotta get that cowboy hat, man. And the boots. <laughs> And the boots. So, someday, got to settle in first. Let's go! <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, Berg, get fired up. Oh, what do you got there? It is a kombucha. It's kind of nice. Oh. Mango passion fruit. Oh. Feeling that passion in your belly? I <laughs> want to say yes. <laughs> All right. Is that like a probiotic thing? It's like made out of mushrooms or something. Yes. It's made out of oh. something. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else yeah. drinking anything? I got my, I got my, uh, I, I threw one in the fridge when I got home, but then I got to record right away. We, I, we were recording earlier than I expected. That's okay. Uh, but I've got my, my summer shandy nice. that I threw in the fridge. I, I, I couldn't get it cold enough in time, so I have a cup filled with ice water that I have been kind of just dipping it in. <laughs> hoping to get it, hoping to get it cool enough to to enjoy. Wow! Hey, uh, and uh, last weekend I was in uh, Kansas for my niece's wedding. Yeah, a shout out to someone who's actually been on the show who performed the wedding, Pastor Kilgo. Hmm. Yep, Kilgo. Yeah, <laughs> Kilgo, a pastor in Lawrence, Kansas. You know him, don't you, Berg? I do. Yeah. Yeah, he's the one that performed my niece's wedding. Nice. He's a good guy. So. So yeah, our, our uh, we have three different states here represented. So it might be a little clunky still with the timing. We're still getting used to that, and I'm old. <laughs> kind of like a I, you can't read my shirt, but uh, I've got a sleeveless on because I'm if I have time, I'm gonna hit the weights since I haven't this week yet because oh. I was at a wedding. Yep. But oh, it boy. says it says on here it's a sleeveless tank top makes me look ripped, <laughs> and it says uh. Do not go gentle. Yeah. Do you know that's from Berg? Uh, the poem, right? Do not go yes, gentle I, into I, that. You're the only person I know in this life who would know that without Googling. Into that dark night, right? Rage, yeah. rage against the... Did you know that? You know, I do know it. the dying of the light. Be able to name. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. yeah from so, from uh, Independence Day? <laughs> you will not go gently into the night. <laughs> Very good. I'm glad it predates that. <laughs> yeah. Well, so so I saw this at uh, I think it was a TJ Maxx, and I did a quick. What is that? What do they mean by that? It's about fighting old age. So I thought there it was go. apropos. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's kind of funny how that goes. I mean, you can't win. It's funny because even even the Norse gods are like, yeah, you can't win this. Thor ends up having to wrestle old age as an old crone, and she brings him to one knee. So. They'll never show that in a Marvel movie, but <laughs> yeah, well, well, they don't grow old, right? They well, the Norse gods do. 
Um, Do they? Yep. When uh, Ida is taken, and she's the one who... Uh, it, it, no, it, Edun. She is the one who gives them the golden apples that keep them young. And when she's taken by a giant, uh, all of the Asgardians uh, grow, begin to grow old. Man, I miss you. That's what we, this. Uh, that's exactly what this podcast has been missing. Yeah, poetry. I do what I can. I wouldn't say I'm a hero. <laughs> Maybe a legend or an icon, but never a hero. So, uh, Vicar, uh, wh- what am I preaching on? Ah, <laughs> let's see here. It looks like it is the gospel. According hey, I just I just noticed something, by the way, in the little service folder that you have there. Yeah, so they, I am. I'm impressed. Because this is Wednesday night, right? Yes, it is right. And you have the, the service folder for Sunday. Yeah. And I, I spotted in your service folder, it said Mike off. <laughs> I, I You've do. already marked it I do. for I, Sunday. I, little I mark, notes. I do. I give myself my own rubrics um, so that I can remember when to turn the microphone on and off. That yeah. that that just, that just I'm going to say this, a little vulnerability, that blows my mind. <laughs> like, there's no way I would have done that four days in advance. There's absolutely <laughs> no way. I'm amazed. I, sometimes I'm humbled. And this is a, a, a moment where I just see the words mic off, and I'm I'm humbled. Good work, Vicar. <laughs> well, thanks. Indeed. Good planning ahead. So yeah. so at your your new place, are you on the one year or the three year? I'm actually on the three year here. Wow. Hey, I was recently at a church. And uh, the pastor was going, it was like being real, all hip and stuff, right? Oh, no. Right? Mm-hmm. And he goes like, yeah, we're doing this special thing where we're focusing this year on Matthew. Like it was like state of the art, right? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so I looked. It's it like was, totally it was, tubular, man. <laughs> right. And I looked and they were. he was doing the Matthew reading for that Sunday in the three-year lectionary. <laughs> <laughs> so did he sell it though did the yeah did I, I appreciate I, I appreciate that he was selling it like this new thing <laughs> we're, we're gonna go through the main events in the bible in one year it's gonna be amazing it almost sounds like that's chris christian but like a little bit like it's a pretty good impression it almost sounds like chris christian yeah maybe he'll call in you know berg makes me so so happy and pleased that he's here i might just start we might just get a call from pastor chris christian Indeed. Living the dream. All right, so what do we got here? Uh, do you want to just talk about our text, or do you want to talk about what you're preaching on, Berg? No, you go ahead. All right. All right, well, here's the text. Luke chapter 5. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. All right. So, I've been, one thing I've been starting with, I've been starting with, with uh, Vicar. What do you think? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it does do that. <laughs> uh, Vicar, help me. I haven't written my sermon yet. What, what should I focus on here, Vicar? Uh, you know, I I do like the last line where they they left everything. I mean, they it seems like they caught the huge amount of fish, and the point is made though that they didn't stay and worry themselves over those things that they literally well, walked you, away from. Yeah, it. actually, you gave me a point I never thought of. Really? Yeah. Huh. It's like the natural reaction would be. 
let's 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 keep going. <laughs> Well, yeah, like, well, we got to sort this. We got this, and it's kind of like the... No, I'm thinking long term. Oh, I'm oh, thinking, yeah, like that. Like, leave everything behind? What do you mean? Like, yeah. if we can do this every day... Right, we, ju- we just turned a corner here. We just, you know, we're ahead for the first time, maybe, or whatever. Like, we should do this. That would have been the natural inclination. Right, and I also like the, the surprise that Peter has uh, when uh, when God's word does what it, he says it does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we get, we get, uh, isn't that the ways of the church? We don't want to trust God's word. Like we want to do it our way. Oh yeah. Like we've been trying, but it's not working. Mm-hmm. Let's do all this other stuff. Maybe we can get it to work. Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like let's, let's try something new and innovative. Right. Let's not trust baptism or the sacraments or any of those things or prayer. Mm-hmm. Right. Let's not trust those things. We got a better way. What's running through that that mind of yours, Zerberg? Oh, I was just thinking of a sweet alliteration uh, way of breaking up this sermon. Hmm. So, like, good things, you know, this great catch of fish, right? That's Mm -hmm. a good thing, right? Yeah. The guilt that Peter receives by receiving these good things. It's interesting how many people you meet feel guilty because God has done good to them. Right? I mean, don't yeah. you meet parishioners like that? They feel guilty yeah. that God has done good things. And, I mean, this is a good thing, right? Mm-hmm. This is a good thing that God has given, you know, these fishermen so many fish. And it may not seem like such a good thing, but it is. And, I mean, people feel guilty about that, right? And that's the first thing that comes into Peter's mind. It's not, whoa, this catch of fish, thank God. It's, uh, you need to go away. I'm <laughs> yeah. guilty, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then the goal, right? What is the goal here? The goal of the fish was to bring Peter to repentance and to faith. The goal of the apostles is to go out and catch men. And the goal of every Christian is to be caught or to follow him. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, it's interesting. It is interesting how, uh, how in a sense, we don't, I don't think we often think of it this way, how a good thing pr- brought repentance. Yeah, th- that is interesting. Yeah, we but I mean, you know, we don't usually think about it or preach it that way, but I mean, think of how many people feel guilty because God does good things for them. Uh, so so let's let's play with this idea. So let's let's think of good things that happen that bring people to repentance. And I can think of one event, like the biggest one. Mm-hmm. Uh, birth of a child. I thought of that one too. Yep. Where it kind of reorganizes your priority. You realize, oh, like a human being came out of my wife's body. Right. Like yeah. we didn't do enough work to be able to cause that. Right. You know? <laughs> right. I mean, my participation was just taking care of my wife, I suppose. <laughs> right. And uh, all of a sudden, that ha- what happens is, uh, and, and that actually happens all the time as a, a as a parent. You children are very good at reflecting your weaknesses. Hmm. Like if you if you if you are short with your children and with in a certain way. And then all of a sudden, one of your children gets upset, and they say in frustration the same things you say. Yeah, <laughs> that never happens, does it, Peter? No, not <laughs> once. Yeah, I imagine uh, uh, your son uh, just starts screaming Latin. <laughs> Berg, not not yet. No. Oh, okay, better work he'll, on that. He'll he'll just uh, cross his arms and go, hmm, Stevie <laughs> oh. mad inside. <laughs> But he also so does he, that. He also does that too when he sees somebody who's sad, right? And I think that's one of the reasons why people feel a lot of guilt, because they look at sometimes the sorrow and the heartache and the hardship of other people's lives, and hmm. they of course are operating with the law, and they're like, "Well, why do I deserve such good things?" Right? And then they feel guilty about having those things when Jesus doesn't even address that. He doesn't say to Peter, oh, you're okay. You're good in my book, right? What does he say? (laughs) Don't be afraid, right? He doesn't dispute uh, 
Peter's guilt. And I think sometimes that w- that's what we try to do. We try to make people not feel that. And sometimes I think that guilt is good because it shows we're still operating under the old rules. We're still operating under the rules of the law. And if that's the case, then we should feel guilty because we don't deserve, well, anything, any success in business, any birth of a child, any uh, reason to gather together. Um, you know, Peter was blessed in so many ways. I mean, Jesus chose, even though he had had a hard night, Jesus chose his boat to be in. I mean, that in and of itself would have been huge, right? And he preaches mm-hmm. to all these people from Peter's boat. And then, you know, he listens to the prophet. He brings in this whole catch of fish. I mean, it's like grace upon grace upon grace here. Hmm. Um, and he doesn't know what to do with it. And the, the other thing is, Peter has no idea what he's getting into. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, this is not exactly an easy life either. Right. But this is why it's interesting, because in Luke 5... Peter does this, and then what does he do in John 21? He goes a fishing, right? Right. right. Yes, he does. Af- right. After after the resurrection, he, uh, you know, so it's interesting because it says they left everything and followed him. But you see in the Bible that uh, this is not a vow of poverty like what the Roman Catholics do. Peter still has a house. Peter still has a mother-in-law. And John 21 seems to teach that they still had their boats. They still had their nets. Which were probably uh, hard, or were not cheap. (laughs) Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, these boats were more than likely passed down from father to son. You know, you worked on them. I mean, so, you know, when it says that they left everything and followed Christ, this is not, as the Roman Catholics imagine, um, selling all your goods and, you know, begging for a living, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, It's the same way with Paul. Paul made tents, right? But what this is, is they left everything. That is, they left all of these worldly concerns behind, and they devoted themselves entirely to the kingdom of God in preaching and in teaching and the like. Uh, All right. Very good. Uh, So, Berg, you have a top 12 list, don't you? I do. I do have a top 12 list. So, Peter, play the intro. Enough nonsense. It's time for Bullhagen's Top 12. All uh, right. That music. That music, it's, huh? It's so good. <laughs> All right. So, um, my top 12 list for today is something that we see in church all the time, but something that we might not think about. And it's really interesting because... Uh, this, what I'm thinking about is really the focus point of the church. I mean, most churches are built to focus on this one particular, you know, piece of furniture in the church. And that piece of furniture is the altar. So why do we have an altar? What does the altar mean? Why is it important to have? All right. So my top 12 list is for why altars are important. Huh. And why we should, you know, pay attention to him. Number 12. The altar is a symbol of prayer. This goes all the way back to Exodus 30 with the altar of incense, where the priests would burn incense every day. We hear this also in Psalm 40, uh, 141, verse 2. Let my prayers rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. And we also see this used in Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, which says, Another angel with a golden censer came and stood at the altar, and he was given much incense to add to the prayers of all the holy people as he put it on the golden altar in front of the throne. From the angel's hand, the smoke of the incense went up before God with the prayers of the holy people. And so the altar, along with incense, is a symbol of prayer. Hmm. All right. And I was going to say some things about it, but I think what I'm going to say might be included in your other 11 things. There we go. Number 11. The altar shows us where God graciously appeared to his people. Genesis 12, verse 7. 
The Lord appeared to Abram, I'm going to give this land to your descendants, he said. Abram built an altar for the Lord who had appeared to him. Hmm. So the altar here shows us where God has graciously appeared to his people. And where does he appear to his people? Well, he appears to us here graciously uh, through his word and through his sacraments. That's why the altar is so important. It shows but us Vic, that God... Oh, go ahead. But Vicar, I thought God was everywhere. <laughs> That's right. Why do we even bother going to church? God is everywhere. <laughs> I mean, you could make uh, your boat an altar, couldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go stand amongst the trees. That'll be good enough. <laughs> well, and unfortunately, that I mean, there are other Bible passages for that, right? God chastises right. the people of Israel for going and sitting under every green tree, right? <laughs> right, but the, the point is, though, that yes, God is everywhere, but he has certain times where he promises to meet with you. Mm-hmm. Right. Right, and that brings us to the next point. Number 10. The altar is a physical place where God's people meet to receive God's gifts. We see that in Genesis 13, 3 through 4, where moving from place to place, Abram went from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place between Bethel and Ai where his tents had been the first time, the place where he had first made the altar, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And so here we see that this calling on the name of the Lord isn't just prayer, it's actually a synecdoche talking about the entire worship of the Old Testament, the preaching of the gospel, which Abraham did uh, in his sojourning among the Canaanites so that they too might hear God's word. Now, very few of them heard it, believed it, and were saved. But nevertheless, the altar is a physical place where God's people gather together to receive his gifts. And I think that's especially important in our day and age of digital church and that sort of thing. Church is important. Because yeah, there's place is important. We're not big on holy places anymore, are we? No. No, just the opposite, right? Haunted houses. <laughs> right? I mean Yeah. Yeah, you could even places. Yeah, I mean you could even say that in a sense, the last holy places in the sense of a mysterium tremendum as Rudolf Otto says, are these haunted houses. That's the only thing that's left, right? Um and it's too bad because those places are more than likely infested with demons that are leading people astray, or people are, you know, or, the, or there are there are places that people think of almost being holy. Like if you you've ever watched any of the Masters turn a uh, golf tournament, the way they talk about that golf course, mm-hmm. the hallowed grounds, talk about all right. the history of the great golfers who have played here immortalized by beating their green jacket. It's if you it's, it's very much or the way people talk about Lambeau Field. Well, that's understandable. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it um it, yeah, all of those things are true. And you especially see it still with the military, right? Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, uh Gettysburg, all these places, right? The way that they've talked about it. Um you know, so we have our holy places. The problem is, is people don't recognize the true holy places, the place where God meets them every Sunday uh, to give them forgiveness, life, and salvation. So, any more you want to talk about there? So, I read an interesting article about this as to why pews are better for the sanctuary than, like, movable chairs and i thought this was just going to be kind of a picky thing to worry about like who cares if you're sitting in chairs or sitting in a pew but it had to do with what we're talking about your holy place something set aside specifically for one reason only rather than interchangeable and you could rearrange it and it becomes like a fellowship hall or a place to have a school dance or whatever it was not set aside uh for one use for for holy purposes it was uh, if you switch out the pews for for table or or chairs rather you have made it more common and i thought that was an interesting article i'd never thought i had an opinion about whether chairs or pews were better and now i think pews are better for the sanctuary yeah i mean i think these are good things to think about that everything in in church should teach right and what do chairs teach well that you know we really don't care about something you know that is solid immovable right Mm -hmm. We can just take them, we can just take them and use them for, you know, a potluck as we can for church, as we can for, I don't know. Chairs are more individualistic too. 
right? And they are, yeah, they are. So, so no, and yeah, so that's another reason. Number nine. The altar teaches us modesty. This is kind of an interesting one. Um, this comes from Exodus twenty twenty six, where God says, don't go up to my altar on steps because you must not expose your nakedness over it. Hmm. Right? So the altar actually teaches us modesty. This is why uh, altars were not up steps, lest the priest fall over and expose himself to the congregation, right? Mm -hmm. That would be uh, ecclesia instead of northern exposure, that'd be uh, ecclesiastical <laughs> exposure, right? Um, That's pretty good. Right? So, um, which is not cool, right? So the altar can also teach things like chastity. It can teach modesty, that we should dress in a particular way when we approach God's altar, right? Just as the priests of old had to, had to do that, so too should we do that, right? So if you go up to the Lord's Supper and, you know, you're wearing a low-cut dress as a woman or, you know, I don't even know what the equivalent for a guy is. Skinny well, jeans, basically I guess. what I wear every day. Yeah, sleeveless tank top. <laughs> right? I mean, it's not it's not very modest, right? So, you and, know. and and that that and, and the point is is uh, that modesty that external modesty that we have reflects also an internal right of uh, you know, not just do I want to appear unclean and not have anything uh by God's altar, then it also informs how we think of ourselves, what we're thinking about, what we're doing when we are in God's house. This is yeah. a, a language. This is a language that uh, we often think. This is the language that most little children understand before anything else. Is they may, a child who doesn't understand any of the words? sees people wearing robes and bowing. They see people acting differently than they 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 other other places that they see. They uh see the candles. They they see all of the reverence towards the altar and which makes them think that this is a special and holy place even if they don't understand all the words. Uh, a, an example of this and we've talked about this before on the show is uh oftentimes uh, a little kid will see a pastor outside of the church, and they'll think he's Jesus. <laughs> Why would a kid think he's Jesus? Because, well, he's wearing a robe. He, uh, When he talks, oftentimes people stand up. They understand that uh, what the pastor speaks when they see him on Sunday morning is very, very important. Hmm. They understand the reverence, and uh, they they understand those things as being something that's different than anything else that they see. Right. It's interesting because you made me think now about a short story I'm reading by uh, Honoré Balzac called uh, The Vicar of Tours. The original title was The Celibates. And one of the interesting thing is thing in that is that the three main characters are all celibate, but they're not chaste. And even though they're celibate, that is, you know, they are, you know, two of them are priests and one of them is an old maid, you know, even though they don't have a husband or a wife and they're not, you know, having relations, their evil passions take on these really nasty forms. And so getting back to what you said there, right, it's not about just appearing modest, but also uh, being modest. It's kind of like not just being celibate, but also being chased right right because there, there otherwise are, i i believe that sometimes uh the uh the exterior actually helps inform the interior yeah right i said this used to drive my kids probably peter too crazy and so when they were remember what i used to do when you were really grumpy make him smile i'd make him smile yeah for 30 seconds <laughs> And it was really hard for them to keep being grumpy. Yeah. You yeah. didn't stick him in a get along shirt, like stuff two kids. They would into fight a wanting shirt. to smile because they knew what would happen. Huh. I'm not done being angry. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, and that's true, right? Is that unfortunately a lot of American Christianity, you know, they don't care about things like altars. They don't care about externals at all. And it's really too bad because externals right. teach young children. Externals exhibit the faith that is found in the heart. So externals are very important. Um, uh, and another, another example I'm going to ask a vicar quite. We never really talked about this, but I'm going to ask you something okay. in your journey here as a vicar, right? Yeah. Uh, one thing that you've really done this year is you've started lifting weights. That's true. Right. And you might think, well, that's just a body thing. Have you noticed that it affects you in other ways? It, it has. I mean, it improved. I'm not sure where you're going, but it improves all kinds of different things in my life. It makes physical tasks easier, makes me sleep better. Um, but it also gives me more confidence, I would say. like Right? Uh, a pushing through things? Yeah. I'm always, I get that little bit of satisfaction three times a week that I did it again, I didn't quit, and that, that feels good too. Uh, so it's not just physical. Because I, I do think that uh, exercising and working on physical strength does something like a mental strength too about it. Yeah. That you're pushing yourself to do things, especially for the day you don't want to exercise. <laughs> yeah. Then I have those days, in case anybody wonders. Uh, I think sometimes, this is probably a side topic, sometimes thinking back on when I knew somebody that had worked out a lot or whatever, they looked good, and I, and I wasn't an exerciser at the time, I would only see the end product and think, well, yeah, of course, it's easy for that person because they're physically fit. This stuff's easy for them. Well, it's not easy for them. It's hard every time. They just do it anyway. I mean, now that I'm doing it, I see that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's awesome. So, externals are important, right? Yes. Number eight. The altar teaches us about who God is. It's interesting how many altars in the Old Testament actually have names. So, for example, like Judges 6.24. So Gideon built an altar for the Lord there and gave it the name, The Lord is Peace. Even today, it is still in Ophrah, which belongs to... Uh, Abiezer's clan. And so that's interesting, right? That he uh, that he uh, names this altar and it teaches who God is, right? Mm -hmm. That he is peace. Well, how can he be the God of peace if he's sending Gideon to war? Well, um, he's sending Gideon to war so that Gideon might establish peace in the land, which he does. The so, uh, the same thing happens uh, in Genesis uh, 18. It was 18 or 22. I always get that mixed up. The sacrifice of Abraham, or Isaac, where right. he builds an altar and, and, and says, calls the Lord will provide, because to this day it is said, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Right. Um, again, Jacob does the same thing here, right? In Genesis 33, verse 20 where it says uh, when he returns to Canaan, uh, he, uh, he put up his tents, he buys land, and he builds an altar there and called it a mighty God is the God of Israel, right? Mm -hmm. Because he's, uh, he's escaped from the hands of Esau. He left with only a staff in his hand, and 20 years later he comes back with uh, huge flocks and herds and servants and slaves and, you know, Two wives and two concubines and eleven children and I mean it's uh, it's a pretty pretty big deal, right? What what I like about your explanation of this Berg is this is people might wonder, okay, when we look at the altars in the Old Testament, how do we know we're not talking about suggest that an Old Testament ceremonial law that we don't need to follow anymore, like eating pork, for example. Mm -hmm. And all the there's a whole host of them, right? Sure. Um, well, what Berg is talking here, Vicar, is is uh, less specified. It's talking about the what the altar did, the character of God, and uh, not just those ceremonial laws which pointed to Christ. Um, I think he's talking in a way that also is not just a way. Well, now these altars are fulfilled in Christ, but there's a, a unique connection with Jesus and the altar too. Hmm. Exactly. And as we go on, we'll uh we'll see more of that, right? More of that awesomeness. 
So, all right, should we go on to... Number seven. The altar shows the unity of faith. There should be one altar. Okay? So, for example, in uh, Joshua 22, uh, verse 1... Um, I'm sorry, I uh, have some stuff going on. Okay. So, in Joshua 22, Joshua called for Reuben, Gad, and the other half-tribe of Manasseh and let them go home, right? They uh, were able mm -hmm. to go back across the river. And yet, uh, there's there's some uh, really funky stuff that goes on here, okay? Um, they end up building an altar uh, across, the, uh, across the river here. They go back, and they, uh, let's see here, they built an altar so large that it caught the eye. And then in verse 11, it says this, Hearing about it, the rest of Israel said, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar at the frontier of Canaan in the region of the Jordan that is next to the Israelites. And they get mad. They actually get the armies ready to go fight against them. They say that they have rebelled against the Lord, right? Um, and it's mm -hmm. the same thing here in the New Testament. So, for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 uh, verses 18 to 22, where it says, and uh, I'll start at 17, right? Or uh, 16, I'll start at 16. Uh, 15, let's do 15, how about that? I'm talking to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is the cup of blessing which we bless not a communion of the blood of Christ? Is the bread which we break not a communion of the body of Christ? All of us are one body, because there is one bread, and all of us share that one bread. See how the Jews do it. Don't those who eat the sacrifices share the altar? What do I mean by this? That a sacrifice made to an altar is something, or that an idol really is something? No, these sacrifices of the non-Jews are made to devils and not to God. I don't want you to be partners with devils. You can't drink the Lord's cup and the cup of devils. You can't share the Lord's table and the table of devils. Or are we trying to make the Lord jealous? Are we stronger than he? So here we see that the altar is a unity of faith. And if you eat at one altar, that means you shouldn't eat at a different altar, right? You should. That's where we get the phrase uh, uh, altar fellowship, or what we often you hear lumped in with altar and pulpit. Right. But they are two different things. So when the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh build this large altar at the frontier by the Jordan River, what? how did the people of Israel interpret it? They're like, oh, these guys are, they're no longer a part of us. They're, they're establishing their own altar. They're establishing their own religion. They're establishing their own nation. They don't want to be a part of us anymore. They've rebelled against God. Now, of course, if you keep reading, and what we'll talk about uh, a little bit later, uh, we'll find out that that's not the case. But um, And it's the same way in the New Testament. You don't commune at altars of devils and of idols, right? You don't do that. Mm -hmm. you, this The altar shows a unity of faith, and it's a unity of faith in eating, right? In eating. It's always been about eating. You partake of the altar— and you become a partner with it, right? And you're either a partner mm -hmm. of God or you're not, right? So the altar shows the unity of faith and that there should be one altar, as opposed to the Roman Catholics who have many, many side altars, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Anything you guys want to discuss there? You're saying it all, Berg. Okay, good. <laughs> Keep it up. Glad I'm not missing anything. All right. Number six. The altar reminds us that those who are far away are still Christians. The altar reminds us that those who are far away are still Christians. Okay, and this goes back to Joshua 22, and I, I hope everybody goes home and reads this uh, chapter because it's a really wonderful chapter because the Israelites go against Reuben and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and they come and they're like, hey, what are you guys doing? 
you're, you know, this is rebelling against the Lord. If you need to, come back on, you know, the west side of the Jordan, right? Join us. We'll make room for you. But don't do this. Don't rebel against the Lord. But we find out what what the intent or the purpose of that altar really was, uh, starting at verse 21. Then Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh answered the leaders of the clans of Israel, The God of gods is the Lord. The God of gods is the Lord. He understands, and Israel should understand. If there is rebellion here or treachery against the Lord, don't save us today. If in building an altar for ourselves we turn away from the Lord and offer burnt offerings on it or food offerings or make peace offerings on it, may the Lord punish us. We did this only because we're troubled about the future. When your children may say to our children, what have you to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? The Lord has made the Jordan a line dividing us from you. You descendants of Reuben and Gad have no share in the Lord. So your descendants may make our descendants stop worshiping the Lord. Then we said, let us do something for ourselves by building the altar, not for burnt offerings or sacrifices, but as a witness between us and you and between our descendants and af after us, that we may worship before the Lord with our burnt offerings, sacrifices, and peace offerings. Then your descendants can't say in the future, in the future, can't say to our descendants, you have no share in the Lord. So we thought, when in the future we or our descendants are told this, we will answer, look at the model of the Lord's altar our fathers made, not for burnt offerings or sacrifices, but as a witness between us and you. Far be it from us to rebel against the Lord or to turn away from the Lord today by building another altar for burnt offerings, food offerings or sacrifices besides the altar of the Lord our God that is before his tabernacle. So there we see the altar reminds us that those who are far from us, those who are divided from us either by language or by distance, they're still Christians. They still have a share in the Lord with us. Um, and, I mean, really, if you want to say, say it this way, I mean, that altar that they built, this model of the Lord's altar, uh, was really like the first oh, I don't know, denominational uh, logo, right? It was like mm -hmm. using LCMS before it's cool, <laughs> right? Because, I mean, those words are supposed to mean something. That you go to a congregation like this, and it has these things on the door, well, you expect them to be worshiping the Lord. You expect them to hold uh, to the things that God has commanded and to prohibit the things that he's forbidden, you expect them to, you know, um, do all these things, right? And 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 really, the the unity also is a fat in the altar that we have is in unity because they all point to the the altar of God's eternal presence, right? So they're they're tied together in that way, um, and so you know, I, I was thinking of uh, their concern is a couple of things where I can understand the sentiment that they are doing here. Uh, we went through this uh, kind of conversation early in our own church history here on, on this side of the pond. Right. When, uh, when uh, we had to get our pastors who were blessed at an altar in Germany. Right. <laughs> that wasn't working out so well. Right. Uh, it, it took a lot to actually say, okay, we're going to have a seminary uh, where we're going to actually do that here. Yeah. Uh, that was actually a big step for them, really. Right. But it wasn't to be separatist. It was to reflect the same altar. Right, that we are still in fellowship with these people, right? And, I mean— you... and The other thing oh, go the ahead. other thing I made me think of is uh, made me think of uh, how a lot of these things, their concern is, they're concerned, well, when we're worried about you guys going astray, and where will that leave us? Right? Right. And that made me think of exactly what's going on in Africa right now. Right. Where, where uh, I, you know, we like to think of us as the, the faithful ones, and, and we're reaching out to those poor people in Africa. I mean, where are the more diligent Christians are right now? Mm. Not here. Yeah, not right? here. Well, and I think, too, this doesn't have to just simply be a terrestrial geography either. Right. That those who are in heaven are also Christians. Right? Right. I... So right. every time you look at the altar, I mean, it should be a reminder that 
you know, if your son or daughter or grandkid, you know, um, have, have, has moved away and is worshiping, you know, somewhere else, um, you know, but they're still hearing the same gospel and receiving the same gifts, you know, I mean, that's, that's a good thing. This, to me, uh, I've been to three different synod conventions and, uh, that, that to me, those are always my favorite parts is, uh, and, uh, this year I believe they're, they should be voting on, uh, South Sudan, whether they're welcome the Lutheran Church of South Sudan into fellowship with us. Didn't Beisel go um, over there and teach at one of their seminaries? Yeah, yeah and uh, and uh, Lutheran Heritage Foundation um, had a big part in, in getting people to teach at the seminary and get that going. Um, but uh, what I like about it is is exactly what here. There's people all over the world where, in a sense, we are saying we share the same altar. Yeah. Right, I mean that's the whole point, and it's a and it's a long process. Yeah, where we we make sure we're not we don't just you know uh, the way most people think that Lutherans should get along is just oh yeah we got our differences oh well we still like each other right no it's a, there's a process to make sure that they they hold to God's word in the Lutheran confessions and have shown that. Yeah, I mean... Without that, we, we can't do it. Well, and it's interesting because, you know, like the Israelites, they were willing to go to war over this, over the building of mm-hmm. an altar. We might think it's a trifle, but it is definitely a tremendous trifle. It is important. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes I, I wish we would take some of these... We would be as zealous about some of these things, you know, uh, rather than just simply leaving people to do whatever they want, you know? right. And you know, if you think if you think about it, it was wasn't that long ago in Ireland where like Protestants and Catholics were fighting vehemently, you know? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean yeah, and there's so much tied up there that's was so wrong and that's, evil. Right. But at the same time, you know, um it's kind of an important thing. So all right. Well good. Should we continue? Let's go, let's go. Number five. The altar is a symbol of the preaching of the gospel and what hearers owe their preacher. This comes from 1 Corinthians 9, verses 13 and 14. Paul says, Don't you know that the men who work at the temple get their food from the temple? That those who help at the altar get their share of what is on the altar? In the same way that the Lord, the Lord has ordered that those who tell the good news should get their living from the good news. So in other words, those who preach the gospel should get their wages from the gospel. So every time you see the altar, um, you should think, okay, this is the gospel, right? This is the good news. Mm -hmm. This is what this is symbolizing. And that also means that I should take care of the man who is there ministering at the altar, the one who is serving at the altar, that he should get his wages from preaching the gospel. Hmm. So the so every time you look at the altar, you should think, oh, maybe my pastor needs a raise. <laughs> <laughs> Not for filthy lucre, but you know, I mean, because unfortunately, that's that's a real that's lucre's a, a great word. Isn't that a great word? I love that word. <laughs> every translation, I don't even care what it is, should just have filthy lucre in it. You know, <laughs> just because. Right, oh. just like every you, you it offends you when you hear a prayer and it says "take to heart," don't you? I do. It makes me sad. On You'd rather side. have inwardly digest. I would. <laughs> it's much, much better. Number four. Uh, the altar shows us that the Old Testament people were saved, as we are saved through faith in Christ, and we see this in Hebrews chapter nine, verses eleven through fifteen. But Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come. He went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made by human hands that is not part of our created world. And he didn't use the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered only once into the Holy of Holies and paid a price that frees us forever. Now, sprinkling the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a calf on unclean people makes them outwardly holy and clean. How much more will the blood of Christ, who by his everlasting spirit offered himself without a spot to God, Wash our consciences for clean from dead works to worship the living God. So here, the Old Testament people are saved in the same way that we are saved 
by faith. All of the bulls and goats and calves and the ashes of a heifer, all of that foreshadowed what Christ did on the cross. It made people— you, you went, Oh, go ahead. Yep. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. This timing thing, we're still working on that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's it's interesting to me when we, when we look at artwork, especially modern artwork, right? And you have depictions of Jesus— you have Jesus with the children, or Jesus a shepherd, or Jesus teaching his disciples, or obviously Jesus on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Uh, but how many references or images or reflections are there of Jesus at the altar? Whether it's the mercy mercy seat or the blood in the temple, or uh, Jesus being in it saying, "I must I I be the business of my father, my father's house." Or in Revelation, the lamb on the, the throne before the altar. Right. Uh, how much of imagery and how often Jesus is tied to an altar uh, uh, through the Old Testament and all those things that it points to, and also really in the, the New Testament, when the when the, the curtain tears in two, for example. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, you'd think there'd be more of that, but we just like smiley Jesus, you know, playing, you know, <laughs> ghost baseball with that kid. <laughs> Boy, by the way, Vicar, that is going in your report. Oh yeah, so that picture of Jesus playing baseball with the kid, like I took it off the wall after <gasps> no! that for three hundred days, no! in a... <laughs> and and I put it in a in a drawer of the desk, and I had forgotten I had done that. It was up for most of the time I've been here, and then uh, I guess it was Peter Wagner who just stopped by, right? And I'm like Vicar. Where's the picture? Where's the picture? Because he checked uh, out my office, and uh, and I and I had forgotten I'd taken it down. So then I got caught by everybody that I'd taken the, <laughs> the picture down and had to put it back up. So now it's back on the wall where it belongs. <laughs> well, I just need the one where Jesus takes the steering wheel next, I guess, to put right next to it. Well, <laughs> Bullhagen, how long has that one been in there? Uh, that's been there since Carney, because the kid kind of reminded me of Carney. <laughs> so that's been there since <laughs> what? That would have been like six <laughs> Uh, no, maybe eight. <laughs> it's been there for a while. It went back up. It's back where it belongs. <laughs> okay. It's only down for a week or two. Okay. Well, well, <laughs> okay. So speaking, so speaking of this, this actually leads us right into number three. Number three. The altar is a place of safety <laughs> for Vicar to run to because he took down the picture. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so oh, uh, from here, Exodus twenty one fourteen. If anyone strikes another so that he dies, he must be killed. If he didn't plan it, but God let an accident happen to him, I will appoint a place where he can flee. But if one boldly attacks another to kill him by trickery, take him even from my altar to be put to death. Okay? This then sets up what happens in First Kings. So when Solomon is made king, and this is what they should do, I mean, if they really wanted like a biblical miniseries, have like the life of David and the life of life of Solomon, because it's yep. like it's so full of drama. I mean, who needs like these terrible games of throne, you know, Game of Thrones shows to right. you know do that? Kind it, of stuff. it wouldn't be PG. <laughs> so if you remember, uh, Ad- Adonijah, who was Solomon's older brother, basically tried to have himself declared king while his dad was still alive. You know, and there were factions, and Joab was in on it, and so there was a lot of stuff going on, right? Um, but mm-hmm. David then, in his old age and weakness, appoints Solomon king. Well, what happens? Adonijah is then a traitor, right? He deserves to die mm-hmm. because he basically has rebelled against his youngest brother. And so Adonijah was afraid of Solomon. He rose and left and took hold of the horns of the altar. Someone told Solomon, Adonijah is afraid of the king and has taken hold of the horns of the altar, saying, May King Solomon swear to me today he will not kill his servant with the sword. So here we see that Adonijah flees to the altar for safety, for refuge. And he's not the only... Because he assumes, he assumes there that God is more merciful than... Than Solomon than is, right? Yeah. And so, and yet Solomon then lets him go, right? Uh, he mm-hmm. lets him go for now. Because later on Adonijah is going to screw up again. Of course, right? Because that's what the Bible is mm-hmm. about. <laughs> how we screw up so much. And about right. how God forgives us. So, um, 
the next one is Joab. So the news came to Joab, but Joab, uh, Joab was on Adonijah's side, but he hadn't been on Absalom's side. So Joab fled to the tent of the Lord and took, hor- took hold of the horns of the altar. King Solomon was told, Joab has fled to the tent of the Lord, and he's there beside the altar. Then Solomon ordered Benaniah, Jehoiada's son, go strike him down. When Benaniah came to the tent of the Lord, he told him, the king says, come out. No, Joab answered, I will die here. So Benaniah reported to the king what Joab said and how he had answered. Do as he said, the king answered him, strike him down and bury him. And so you will take away from me and my father's family the blood of innocent people Joab poured out. The Lord will punish him for his bloody deed. He struck down two men more righteous and better than he, and he killed them with the sword. My father knew nothing about it. Abner, Ner's son, the commander of the army of Israel, and Amasa, Jether's son, the commander of the army of Judah. So, it's interesting, right? Because the altar is a place of safety and refuge um, for those who are not bloody men, right? Joab Mm -hmm. did exactly what Exodus told him not to do. Exodus 21 told him not to do, right? He killed these men in cold blood, and he deserved to die for his transgressions. And so even the horns of the altar don't save him, right? The altar is not some magical place, right? It's not like in dodgeball where you have a, you know, a free spot, right? Right. You know, I mean, right. it's it doesn't work that way, right? Um, the altar is there, but, though, for the refuge and the safety of um, really those who haven't committed these heinous acts, right? Right. It is their sanctuary. <laughs> yes. I was actually going to bring that up, too. What's that? What is that from? That is from Psalm. I was thinking more of a Disney movie. Oh. <laughs> Oh, you Disney. Ne- you never saw it? Disney. So like <laughs> Hunchback of, no- of Notre Dame, right? Sanctuary, Sanctuary. Oh, oh yes. okay. The, uh, right. the 1989 movie. That one too. That one's pretty good. So, but yeah. All right. I got to keep going. Number two. The altar teaches close communion. Hebrews 13.10. We have an altar, and those who still worship at the Jewish tabernacle have no right to eat from this altar. Right? So, first, it says we have an altar, not had an altar. Second, it says that there's something on this altar to eat, right? Mm -hmm. And finally, it says that the Jewish, uh, those who still worship at the Jewish tabernacle, that is, non-Christians, those who uh, refuse to believe in Christ, have no right or authority to eat from our altar. Right. So this teaches close communion. This teaches that, hey, uh, we can't do this. Right. You have no right. And to it do also this. teaches that the the altar isn't just an Old Testament thing. Right. Exactly. Because have, of course, is present. <laughs> present. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it's right now. Um, so and that's important. Right. Because I think when people are ashamed of close communion, they're actually ashamed of the gospel. Because close communion isn't just law. It isn't. Like, we should rejoice that God does not partner up with demons. We should be, we should rejoice that light has, you know, no concord with darkness. That our God doesn't just simply make, you know, he's not just wheeling and dealing. And uh, when he says something, uh, it's true. And we can trust in that, right? It actually is black and white. I have an example. It's like saying that uh, marriage marriage is only about those you cannot have relations with. <laughs> right, exactly. And that's what open communion is. It's like having an open marriage. And that's, that's wicked, that's evil. And that doesn't work. Like, the, one of the most beautiful things about marriage is that it's between you and your wife, you know? And that is not that's not the case. So, I mean, this ex- this exclusivity is actually a good thing. It is actually a godly thing. No doubt it is law, but it is also gospel because it shows that our God is not some sort of pimp. He's not some sort of philanderer, right? And that's a good thing. So, anyway. So, so you're saying it clo- it's not only is it closed communion, it also keeps us close? Are you putting the D in parentheses? (laughs) Do I have to? (laughs) (laughs) Well, you have to be closed for it close to be for it to be closed. So 
And number one. The altar teaches us about Christ's sacrifice and what the sacrament gives us. And I think that's kind of everything I've just said. So Right. Mm-hmm. So right. that's a great line from the from the Grundweg hymn, Built on the Rock the Church Doth Stand, right? So what is that? Mm-hmm. Six forty eight in L S B? Uh did you guys sing that for like a year and a half? Well we had uh we actually here had for our hundredth anniversary a arrangement commissioned. Did you record it? We should put that in at the end. Yeah, if if I if I can find it, Peter, I'll send it to you. You can edit it at the end. All right, Bulligan says, Bulligan goes. <laughs> well, you're the producer. I'm hoping by uh, next Wednesday I can have my uh, celebrity uh, roast, a uh, celebrity heretic roast battle. Yes, <laughs> awesome. Got to do it. Uh, Arius versus uh, Joel Osteen. There you go. All right. Well, I think since we're over, we should probably stop. I agree. That's our show. All right. Well, that brings us to a close. I'm so happy to have you with us, Berg. Uh, uh, now back for a more permanent stay, correct? Indeed. Do you want to say that? Indeed. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thank you for listening. I'm Bull Higgin. I'm Berg. This is Vicar. And may your altar be unaltered. Thank you for joining us. This podcast is available on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Questions, thoughts, concerns? You can contact us on Facebook at facebook.com slash clerical heirs podcast, on Twitter at clerical heirs P for podcast, or email us at feedback at clerical Thanks for listening to clerical heirs. See you next time.